Hello, Warden Church family. Warm greetings from Mwanza, Tanzania. My name is Julius Kenyamanyara, and I'm so excited to share with you some of the great things God is doing through the ministries that we have the privilege of serving. This year, we have been blessed to serve over 1,300 children through our education program, nutrition, healthcare, and shelter, as well as discipleship. I'm especially so much excited to share with you that this year in September, we launched a new uh, center called Village of Hope Bulale, where we are currently serving over 250 children in that particular community. At Petra City Church, we are experiencing God in amazing ways. We have seen growth and transformation, and right now we are in the middle of constructing our new multipurpose auditorium. This has been a faith journey for us, and we have seen God's provision in every step of the way. Thank you so much for your continued prayers, your encouragement, and your financial support. It means so much to us. We pray that you'll continue to be part of this story and part of our journey. God bless you. Good morning, I'm Carrie Ann. I'm one of the pastors here at Warden. We wanna welcome you. We're so glad that you're here with us today. And uh, if you're new at Warden, we would love it if you would fill out a connection card so that we can get to know you and help you get connected. You can fill out the card at our welcome desk, or you can text I knew exactly this appears on the screen 647-371-1007. We want to thank you so much for your faithfulness in the way that you give to Warden. If you would like to give today, there's a couple ways that you can do that. Uh, if you're in person, you can drop your giving at the boxes provided. You can give online by going to wardenpogospel.com slash give, or you can mail in your giving or drop it off at the church during the week. It's Christmas time! I'm so excited for Christmas. I'm sure you are as well. Um, Christmas is the time for giving. So we have a few ways that you can give here at Warden towards Christmas and towards people in need. So first of all, we have our Christmas cheer, and this is where we help families in need from our church um, who might need a little extra boost at Christmas time. If you would like to give to that, there's a drop down box um, in our online giving called Christmas cheer. And also you can write on your envelopes Christmas cheer if you'd like to give to that. The second way you can give is this year we are supporting the Pregnancy Care Center. There is a list of things they are looking for and you can find that list on our website or at our guest services desk in the morning. All right, so really excited. Ward and Kids is putting on a presentation this Christmas. It's called Building Christmas. So mark your calendars, December 15th during the service. Our Ward and Kids will be doing an awesome presentation. And the last thing we need to talk about for Christmas today is our ugly Christmas sweater social. Super excited about this one. Again, mark your calendars December 14th. Register by December 1st so that we can provide all the goods for you guys to be able to eat. And we're going to have food, fellowship, Christmas carols. It's going to be such a fun time. Make sure you come and enjoy that event with us. It's the time that we... We get ready, preparing ourselves for the coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus came when he was born on Christmas Day, and we should get our hearts ready by thinking about him. This is the first Sunday in Advent. The first candle is the candle of hope. Hundreds of years before Jesus was born, God spoke through prophets in the Old Testament to tell the people that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come. This candle of hope is symbolic for the long years of waiting and hoping for when Jesus would come and save the people from their sins. <laughs> Listen to the words of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 7:14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will be called him Emmanuel. The prophet Isaiah reminds us of the hope that God gives us in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the light of the world. Today when we light this candle to remind us that we wait with hope for the day when we celebrate again the birth of Jesus. We hope that everyone will come to know God and to worship God. 
Thank you, Jesus, for coming to earth, just like the prophet said, and for your promise to come again. Thank you, Jesus, for being our light so we know how to live. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Shalom and Joanna. Such a great job. Appreciate you guys doing that. It's so great to come into the Advent season. I know, I know, my wife is thinking that I have a little bit of a Grinch reputation. And I cannot deny it completely. But I did let her put up our Christmas tree a whole week before December this year. And I even got up yesterday morning and made cinnamon buns for the family as we decorated it yesterday morning. So that's got to get me some anti-Grinch points somewhere along the line. Am I right? You know what you're talking about. Some of y'all don't like to decorate till after December. And then a couple days after Christmas, like before the New Year come, you're like, you better get that out of my house, right? You know how it is. No, it's all good. Uh, it is so great to be able to stop. And let's just do that for a minute. Just stop. And think about the hope of Jesus Christ. Amen? What a fitting first candle. Everything begins with hope. There's people in this city. Man, they need hope. They need hope. It begins with hope. It's a hope and a, and a belief, you know, a confident belief in the, our, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth and died for our sins. And so today, uh, confidently, with an anti-Grinch spirit, walk into Advent with me. Amen? Amen. Thanks again, Shalom and Joanna. That was amazing. Um, I love Julius Kenya Manyara. So we're very thankful that we were able to support them. Uh, many of you may not know, but yesterday uh, was the anniversary of his wife's passing four years ago. Uh, so um, if you would, just keep them in your prayers with us, will you? Every year, um, this November the 30th holds a pretty, uh, for a lot of reasons, for my wife. <laughs> Uh, her dad passed away on November the 30th, and I also have an uncle who passed away on November 30th. <sighs> so it's a, uh, oh, goodness, it's a pretty emotional weekend. Uh, but I'm thankful for the hope that we have. And one day, you know, we're going to get to see Jade, and we're going to get to see our family members who have gone on before. And I'm just, I'm just so grateful. What a fitting, what a fitting first candle for Advent. We're going to look into the Word of God. I'm going to wrap up our Nehemiah series. There is definitely so much more I could preach from Nehemiah, but I uh, want to get into a few other things in the next couple of months leading up to Christmas. So um, we're going to wrap up our series on Nehemiah, the city, a city with its walls today. Let me just do a, a quick review for you. Uh, Nehemiah had gotten permission. He was working as a cupbearer under King Artaxerxes uh, in the Persian Empire. And he got permission, basically, to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And when he returned, he focused on understanding the situation. He had to go and get the lay of the land and check everything out. And then he had to also focus in on mobilizing the people and getting them, you know, in the spots where they were supposed to, to be and doing the things uh, that they should be and in places that meant the most to them. So they started rebuilding the wall close to their homes or close to the gate where uh, the priests would bring in the sacrificed, uh, sacrificial animals and whatnot. And so they began to rebuild the wall at places that were precious to them. And uh, I just admire Nehemiah's uh, leadership efforts here in mobilizing. And, and you know what? In uh, the kingdom of God here and today, we need to understand that we got to mobilize where our passions are and mobilize, you know, in our neighborhoods and, and be able to work and do the things that God wants us to do where he has planted us. Amen? Uh, we talked about last week how they faced incredible opposition. It didn't come easy. You know, uh, Tobiah, Sambalit, Geshem, many of these people and many others uh, were, were causing a lot of problems. And we talked about how it comes in waves. And, it's, and uh, it tends to be a good indicator if you're doing anything effective in the kingdom of God is if you're facing some kind of resistance. If you're facing some kind of opposition, there's a good chance that the enemy considers what you're doing a threat to his kingdom. And we're all about the king of kings kingdom. Amen? 
And so we do what we do to advance it in spite of resistance, in spite of the waves of opposition that come. Uh, when we look at chapter 7, now moving on, we see this lineage of, of people. They took a census of all the people that were there. Now, for many of us, we may underestimate the significance of this, but, but I, I've come to the point now in my life where I begin to h highlight these historical records because they are historical documents, and we need to understand that it brings validity to Scripture. It shows that they are historical documents and that they're backed up archaeologically and, and other things. And um, for instance, if you look at the reign of Hezekiah, you know, they have actually found the tunnels that Hezekiah built when he re-fortified the walls of Jerusalem. They found those tunnels underneath uh, the city. And it's, it's, so you can get it all backed up with archaeological evidence and, and the historical records. So I always try to stop and not just overlook all of these difficult names to pronounce in these lineages and these censuses, uh, but to stop and to just consider that I am reading a historical record. I'm reading an account of something that actually happened and to make myself conscious of it. And it also emphasized their reestablishment back in the promised land. As we pick up in chapter 8, we see that once the wall was completed, uh, back in chapter 6 the wall was completed, but once the wall was completed in chapter 8, there was a return to the public reading of the word. There was a return to public worship, and Ezra led the charge. And he led the people in the reading from the platform in front of the water gate, and the people responded, and they responded in many different ways. And I want to take a, a quick look at these before uh, we move on to something a little bit different at the end. But will you just bow your heads and pray with me before we continue? Father, Lord, we surrender to your Holy Spirit. Every day, Lord, from the moment I woke up this morning, Lord, I just full surrender. And so, Father, today, Lord, with our worship, with our voices, our talents we've given you today, O oh God, we've offered... Uh, a sacrifice of praise and worship and song. Lord, uh, I pray that we would also sacrifice and worship with how we give today, Lord, but we also sacrifice and worship with how we receive your word and apply it to our lives. And so we surrender, Lord, to whatever your word speaks to our heart today. Lord, different parts of this message may resonate with each of us in different ways, O oh God. So, Lord, as you lead, O oh God, Apply your word to our hearts today so that it changes us when we leave here, so that we are different, so that we become greater disciples, greater apprentices of the King of Kings today for having heard your word. We love you, Jesus. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. So there's, there was a lot of different um, responses to the word. And the first one uh, I'd like to focus on is they had an intellectual response. And we need to have an intellectual response to the word. The word, the word of God is intellectually uh, full. I don't know how else to say it. Uh, we see the return to the public reading and the studying of the word. We need to understand that they didn't just read it, but they, they got back into it. It says in chapter 8, verse 3, that he read it aloud from daybreak until noon. That's impressive all by itself. And it says, as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. And there was teaching, not just listening. It says in verse 8 of chapter 8, it says, they read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. There was an intellectual response and an intellectual return to God. And we need to make these, these sometimes, you know, we get away from... Uh, and I don't, I don't want to make it seem like your study of the word has to be all academic and whatnot, but there is an intellectual response we make to the word. We need to get in and have the willingness to study. Sometimes we may read something and say, oh, I don't understand that, and move on. God may say, stick around a little bit. It may, God may say, send an email to your pastor and ask him if he's got any resources he can help you with. God may say, go to Right Now Media. Maybe they have some resources on there that can help you. But you know what? There's an intellectual response, especially when we're returning to God, especially when there's repentance and confession and we're returning to God. We need to return intellectually to the Word of God. There was also an emotional response. Uh, chapter 8, verse 9 to 12 says this. says, this is in Nehemiah the governor... Ezra the priest and teacher of the law and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them, This day is a holy 
is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some of those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to the Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink and send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. People's initial response here was of remorse. The initial emotional response is of remorse. And because the word of God brought conviction into their heart. They had realized that over the years, uh, they had been so far from the God of all creation. And their return to the word, their return to the public worship brought an emotional response. It brought a repentance and confession, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. The priests and the Levites encouraged the people by reminding them that this is though a joyous occasion, this is a returning, not to be said. Returning to the word or learning to love it is like taking in a deep breath. Trust me this morning. If you have not got a discipline of reading the word and you're wondering, wondering why you lack strength in certain areas, why, why you struggle in this area of your faith or that area of your faith, always begin with the Word of God. Always begin with the Word of God. I don't know, I honestly, even just this week, I had a moment where I just stopped after reading the Word of God and I sat in my chair in the morning under my lamp and I just held the Bible and I, I literally brought it to my, my, it sounds weird, but I brought it to my nose and I smell the leather on my Bible and I just said thank you God for this book because even though I read in kind of an ordered fashion it's incredible how many times I pick up the word of God and he speaks to my existence and my moments in that day and I think how long have you planned this moment for me since before I was born before I was in my mother's womb he planned those moments for me and I find them out, and I find them in the Word of God. And so, yes, it should instill an emotional response. There's also times where I pick up the Word of God, and I kind of want to push it away from me because it does convict my heart. But there's great joy in that as well because he's calling us back. He's calling us home. And this is what this book is all about. It's God calling his people home. Calling them back to a city. Reestablishing the walls of the city. Reestablishing the walls of their hearts. Reestablishing the worship of his people, calling them home, the, the remnant that was a fraction of what walked through the desert. But now he's calling them home to reestablish the worship in the city that he had given in the promised land he had given them years ago. We look at the word again, we see, thirdly, there is a volitional response. And it just means that they firmly made some decisions in their life. They put some action into place. There were direct and pointed decisions being made, like returning to the adherence of the Jewish festivals. We read in chapter 8 again, in verse 13 to 17, it says, On the second day of the month, the heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra, the teacher, to give attention to the words of the law. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month. And you can see this in this city where we used to live over in, Thor in Thornhill. In, in, in the seventh month, in the, in, in the fall of the year, we would see them set up these structures outside. The Jewish people set up structures outside their home. Today, the Jewish people still are following these festivals. He says, they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns in Jeru and in Jerusalem. Go out into the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees and from myrtles, palms, and shades trees, and make a temporary shelter as it is written. So the people went out and brought back branches and built themselves temporary shelters on their own roofs, the flat roofed homes they had in their courtyards in the courts of the house of God and the, and the square 
by the water gate and the one by the gate of Ephraim. The whole company that had returned from exile built temporary shelters and lived in them from the days of Joshua. This is how long they had been away from what God had commanded them to do. From the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until that day, basically from the day they had taken the promised land, the Israelites had not celebrated it like this. And their joy was very great. There were immediate steps taken to begin to not just read the word, but to practice. When we come back, we got to make a volitional response to God. And we say, well, I haven't been away from God. Well, we all have trips back to God from time to time, do we not? We have moments where life is just quiet and we just seem like we're distant from God. And when we come back, there is volitional things. There's decisions we need to make. There's things we have to put in place, disciplines that we need to put in place if we are to develop this relationship with God, to get back to the word, to prayer, to time, to fellowship. The most underestimated of all of them is fellowship. Finding people to be around that love you and that love Jesus. The word of God inspired them. I love this. As you read down through chapter 8, we can go back to verse 1 again. It says, he brought them together in fellowship, which means it talks about community, right? It says in cha- chapter 8, verse 9, it says, appointed people to their sin. It brought them to a place of repentance and, revol- and vulnerability. That word makes us shiver a little bit, doesn't it? In chapter 8, verse 10, it says, It led them to minister to those in need. They provided service to those in need. It led them to worship in verses 12 and 14. It gave them great joy, it says in verse 17. And in verses 7 and 13, it says, It caused them to grow in knowledge of God, which represents discipleship. It represents apprenticeship. It represents living your life the way Jesus lived lived his life. And in chapter 9, we will see, it led them to confess their sins. Now, confession, again, requires a little bit of vulnerability. It requires openness. It requires opening in our mouth and and, and speaking these words before God. But confession, I believe, also requires us to do this with people we trust so that we have accountability. Confession is simply joyful public declaration of a personal relationship with God and also a more obvious admission of guilt and sin as the outward sign of repentance. Now this definition gives us two types of confessions. First of all, we have the confessions of sin. We read 1 John chapter 1, 9 and 10. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we, have, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. It acknowledges the recognition that we all have sin and we need to confess the sin before God and come before God. There's a confession of sins, but there's also a confessing of Christ as Lord. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This word saved, soteria in the Greek also means healed. Healed from your sin. Saved from your sin. Set free from your sin. The confessing of your mouth. Both of these take a great deal of vulnerability, which as a society we tend to struggle with. Or maybe it's just me. You're saying you don't struggle with vulnerability. You come up on this stage and you cry every week. Yes, I do. But if you know me personally, this is not necessarily... The word in the presence of God does this to me. Nothing else in my life... Maybe see my kids succeed. You know, I watch movies that tug at the heartstring, and my wife is at the end of the couch, and she's sobbing, and I'm over there. I'm like, I know this is the only thing that brings this vulnerability, and man, I need it. In chapter 9, we see this rather lengthy prayer that is prayed by the Levites on behalf of Israel. And prayer arises from a natural progression of repentance on the part of Israel. And repentance, of course, we understand is complete alteration of basic motivation and direction of one's life. Sounds like an understatement, doesn't it? 
Not really, it sounds pretty complete to me. Complete alteration. In other words, a complete 180 turn of basic motivations at the very basic, simple levels. You need to adjust your life and the direction of one's life at the very heart, at the very foundational levels of your life. You say, I am not going to live for my own desires anymore. I'm going to live for his and leave my desires in his hands. It is stopping the path that one is on and turning away from that path and the determination to take it again. I believe we see this in Nehemiah. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 again says, If we claim to have fellowship with him but walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. Faith without deeds is dead. We know that we're saved by grace, but our deeds are the evidence of that grace in our life. I like to see somebody transformed by grace that doesn't affect how they live. If you are transformed by grace and you can't enter into doing good deeds or looking at someone and seeing them with compassion or coming alongside and comforting somebody, grace changes you. It's not that you have to do all these things. The deeds are, there's a checklist that God says, okay, he's done this, 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 and they. It's not that. It's that grace has a transformational power that compels you to do the good that God has done for you. And if we claim to have fellowship with him, if we have fellowship with Jesus, if we have been changed by grace, he calls us to do the good. I love this one phrase in, in, in uh, chapter 9, verses 5. Before the Levites said his prayers, uh, the Levites said this. He says, stand up and praise the Lord your God, who is from everlasting to everlasting. This is how they begin the prayer. And then they led the people in a corporate prayer of repentance. And when I read this prayer, I'm reminded of Stephen's defense. And you can go in chapter 7 of Acts and read about how he stood before the people that were planning to kill him. And he knew he was going to die. And he stood. And instead of defending himself and, and giving account and saying, you know, these are false accusations and this, this, this. He could have got up there and argued with them. But instead he gave a defense for the gospel. And I admire Stephen so much for that. And they dragged him outside the city, threw him off an embankment that would have been about 8 feet high, you know, and then he began to throw rocks at him the size of my fist. And yet still on his knees, he looked to heaven and said, God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's how the, the grace of God changes you. And I'm reminded of that prayer. When, when you look at the Levi's prayer, there is a pattern that you will notice in this prayer. There are large sections that recount God's faithfulness as, as, as uh, Stephen did. They go back and they looked at all the history of how God was re how God was there for them through everything. However, these great testimonies are interrupted quite often by this little grammatical conjunction, this word that plagues much of our lives at times, B U T, but if there is ever a sign that someone lacks self control in their life, it's because they make too many excuses. When they make too many excuses in your life, they make commitments to you and they can't follow up with them and they make excuses. It's a sign that someone lacks self-control. One thing you will notice in this passage is the constant appearance of the word you as well in reference to God. In the first 15 verses alone, this word you appears 20 times with reference to God. When the Israelites looked back at their past, it was clear where their focus should have been and remain. Ever wonder why God is so patient with us? We go through all this history of all of Israel's failures. They confess all their sins from the time of Joshua, the son of Nun, all the way up until they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, which was generations. They confess the sins of God. And now they're standing there. I can only imagine how they would have felt when they read these statements, when they heard these statements read out. Beginning in verse 5, just listen to how many times they acknowledge God in this prayer. He says, you alone are the Lord, in verse 5. He says, you made the heavens and the highest heavens, in verse 6. You give life to everything, the second half of verse 6. You are the Lord God who chose Abram. You heard their cry at the Red Sea. You sent miraculous signs and wonders against Pharaoh. You divided the sea before them so that they passed through on dry ground. But you hurled their pursuers 
earth into the depths. By day you led them with a pillar of cloud, and by night with a pillar of fire. You came down to Mount Sinai. You spoke to them from heaven. You gave them regulations. You made known to them your holy Sabbath. You gave them bread from heaven, and in their thirst you brought them water from a rock. When we lack self-control, when we lack trust, God says, check my record. He says, check my record. He says, look at your life and see how I have been faithful. Every one of us. You might be here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ. And you may not be aware of the times that God has been faithful for you. But when you woke up this morning and you did this, it's his faithfulness. When you woke up this morning and your feet hit the ground, or you took a fork and you brought food to your mouth, or you came outside and you felt you had senses that allowed you to feel the cold that we don't want to feel, but we're thankful we can feel it nonetheless. It's because of his faithfulness. Our return is full of the realization that we distance ourselves from him, not the other way around. Israel is acknowledging that they distance themselves from God. That's why they use this word you. They acknowledge him and they give him his due. How is it that time and time again we find this little word coming in our mouth though? But, 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 but. Ever been there? I sat in a very difficult meeting one time where some people wanted to talk to me about some things they weren't happy about me as a pastor. Yes, that happens. And I stood there and I listened to them and I sat back and I actually felt a great peace of God in the room. And at the end of the night, probably the woman who had the most problem with me, she looked at me, she says, I was waiting. I'm like, what were you waiting for? I was waiting for the yebuts. I'm like, what's a yebuts? Is that a Hebrew word? She's like, no, the yeah, but I was waiting for you to make excuses. I was waiting for you to say, yeah, but this, yeah, but that. But there were some things that they said that I did need to change. I was a young man when I became a lead pastor. For me to think I was 27 the first time I became a lead pastor. I'm 46 now. That's 19 years ago. Still hard to believe when I think of it, because when I think about myself at 27, I kind of feel like I was dumb as a box of rocks. But if you think about yourself 20 years earlier and you don't think that about yourself, there's something wrong. <laughs> but she said, you never said yeah, but once. And again, I felt the peace of God. I felt the board member that was in the room with me put his hand on my shoulder and he nodded in, in approval. Changed my life that moment. Changed my life. After all these declarations about God's faithfulness, we are met with this little word, though. In chapter 9, verse 16, it says, But they, our forefathers, became arrogant and stiff-necked and did not obey your commands. So it's one thing to acknowledge God and say all the great things that God has done for our life. We look back at the testimonies, but it's harder when you've got to be vulnerable and say, God, but we were messed up. We were arrogant. And we can't look at generations past and say they. We have to look at generations past and say we. It says, we were arrogant, we were stiff-necked, and they did not obey commands. It says, they continued to talk about God's faithfulness again, down through chapter 9. And when we get to chapter 9, verse 26, we see this word again. It says, but they were disobedient, and they rebelled against you. They put their law behind their backs. If you don't think that this is true, I invite you to go back to 1 Kings and read about the king uh, Jeroboam, son of Nebat. Go read about his life. You will find out he lived a very wicked life as he, lived, as, as he led Israel, half the kingdom, the ten tribes of, of Israel. Go read about the king Basha, who had all of Jer Jeroboam's son of the bat, had his whole family, every one of his descendants put to death so that they, nobody would come and take the throne from him. Go read about Ahab, who had all the prophets, hundreds of prophets in the land put to death, and, and, and his evil wife Jezebel, who was turning his neck and, and, and causing things, and, and he even looks at Elijah, who rose up at that time. We all hear about Elijah, you know, about how he brought the fire down on, 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 that, on that sacrifice, and, and the prophets of Baal could not do the same. 
If you don't know that story, if you don't know that account, I invite you to go to 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19. Just read it. It's powerful. Go back and look at the kings. Time and time again. Time and time again. They were unfaithful. And they rebelled. And in the face of God, they rebelled. Even when uh, Micaiah, the prophet, came and spoke to Ahab, he still rebelled. He looked at Micaiah and said, I don't want you to come speak to me. You never tell me anything good. Do you go to God and say, God, I need you to speak to me, but I'm only going to listen to the good you say? Trust me, if you want to grow, if you want God to shape you into who he has planned you to good, you got to listen to the tough things too. When God calls you and convicts you and speaks to your heart, you got to do the repentance and the confession thing and the return. You have to do it. We get to verse 28. It says, but as soon as they were at rest, they again, as soon as they were at rest, in other words, a time of peace and no war, as soon as they were at rest, they again did what was evil in your sight. Excuse me. From verse 28 to 35, the Levites confess the sins of the nation right up to the present time. And here we reach the final time. This little conjunction shows up in this prayer in chapter 9, verses 36 to 37. It says, but see, we are slaves today. He says, this is how we got here. It was our unfaithfulness, not yours. He says, but see, we are still slaves today. Still slaves to King Artaxerxes and the Persian army. Still slaves in a land you gave our forefathers, in the promised land. We are standing here now, still slaves because of our sins. Its abundant harvest goes to the kings you have placed over us. The Israelites had a history of being unfaithful, arrogant, rebelling against God. So often we do not find clarity until after the fact. Is this not true? Hindsight is twenty twenty. And thank God his grace never ends. Thank God, as it says in Lamentations 3, that his mercies are new every morning. Because if it were not, we would not be here. We have no right to be here. We've sinned so many times. What right do we have to stand in the presence of a holy God? But yet that's where he promises that we will be one day. And it's only made possible because of him. It's only made possible because he came and he died on the cross and he brought hope which is represented by that flame burning right there we end up looking back only after the struggle and in retrospect and remind ourselves how faithful God has been and we say you were there Lord Jesus when I went through this you were there when I went through that you never left me I can see it now and the enemy comes and says, how could you do such a thing? The enemy comes from a different angle and says, how could you do such a thing? How could you disobey? Your life is out of control. You are not fit to be a part of his family. Ever hear those words? Ever feel those words? He looks at the narrative of our lives and reminds us of all of our failures. He doesn't emphasize God's faithfulness through the struggles. He just magnifies our lack of self-control. He highlights whatever it is we are enslaved to now and makes us believe there is no way out. And some of us right now need to think of what we are enslaved to. It takes time to sit in the quiet of God and allow God to reveal to us what is running our life instead of him. I'm reading this book right now called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Even the title makes me convicted. You live in this city and you don't understand hurry Come and tell me how you figure that out. This city demands hurry. Just to drive across this city demands hurry. You think you can get across the city in 15 minutes because that's what Google said at 10.05 in the morning? You better check again at 10.11 because it might say 55 minutes. This city will test your hurry. It'll test your patience. He tries to sculpt our narrative. He tries to sculpt. He tries to write a different narrative than the one God has written for you. He tries to teach you lies. We talked about this a little bit last week. He tries to sculpt our narrative so that moving forward we believe he is the author. 
You see, he's jealous of God. He wants to be the author. He wants you to believe. Actually, he doesn't even necessarily need or want to be the author. He just needs, needs to make you believe that he is. And we begin living the lie as he narrates our, our descent into excuses and our descent into lack of self-control and our descent ultimately into shame and self-deprecation, thinking that how in the world could I keep doing this over and over again? And then we go back to Romans chapter 7 where, where, we, where we read Paul's words and says, I do what I don't want to do. You know how it goes there. And we try to talk ourselves back into it again. And the enemy comes and he says, you're not like Paul. He could do that. He could get over that, but you can't. This is how he tries it. He has no pen. He has no access to a keyboard. He has no access to anything that has anything to do with the script of your life. All he can do is whisper lies into your mind. All he can do is come and make you believe that you're not worth what God says you are. A son and a daughter of the living King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In fact, let me remind you who the true author is this morning. Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 3, says this. We're going to come back to this at Easter. Already God's planning. I'm going to come back here in Easter. I'm excited about it. Hebrews 12 1 to 3, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, excuse me, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer or author and perfecter or finisher of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, listen to this, scorning its shame, despising its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart, so that you will not lose your self-control. The Roman cross was meant to ridicule. It was meant to put you on spectacle. It was meant for you to be publicly displayed as someone who defied the Roman armies and the Caesar. It was meant for your public disgrace. It was meant for you to be seen as worthless and for you to feel the shame of ever trying to come against the Roman Empire. But instead, Jesus flipped that on its end. And the end result of its shame was his exaltation to the right hand of God the Father. We may feel shame, but let me remind you this morning, the end result of your shame, if you react to it and you turn to God and you confess and you repent, the end result of your shame shame is exaltation to his presence for all of eternity. That should make you say amen this morning. I don't know. That was really quiet. The result of your shame, if you you react to it, and it's it's impossible to say that I'm never going to feel shame again, but when you recognize that it's a lie, it's the enemy speaking it into your existence and trying to make you feel like you are not worth anything. When you recognize it for what it is, when you recognize the Romans' attempt to put the Son of God on the cross and to bring shame to him, when you recognize that he could despise and scorn that shame and turn it into exaltation, when you realize that that's true for yourself, then man that's transformation Christ is scoring shame for all of us so why live in it any longer if it's not our destiny there's two very small three letter words in this passage I've talked about this morning the first one is you the one that represents our source our provision and the one who will never lead us off track And then this other three little word, B-U-T, but. The other precedes, this little word precedes all of our excuses we make. Highlighting our, our failures and our shame. And if you focus on one this morning, if you focus on you, 
And then you, the Son of God, the living God, the one who came to this earth. If you focus on the one three-letter word, you can avoid the other this morning. It's simple, but it's true. We are not that much different than those who return from exile. We read the scriptures and we, in our brain we kind of think we are, but we're not that different. We make these same mistakes today in society. I still repent and confess daily. I still make mistakes as a dad, as a pastor, as a person, as a friend. I still make them. And I go to God and I say, God, I'm not allowing myself to shame. I'm not going to feel shame for something in my life that I'm thinking is going to happen. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to scorn that shame. I'm going to despise that shame. And I'm going to live the narrative that you're writing for me. We all feel battered and beaten sometimes. We all zero in on our mistakes and sins. But God calls us to the healing effects of confession and repentance in the healing blood of Jesus Christ. He calls us to reestablish meaningful connection. That's what Nehemiah is all about. It's reestablishing a meaningful connection with his people. He brought them back to a city, yes, to rebuild a wall, but look at everything that happened. He brought the people together, unifying them around the work. He brought them together, unifying them around the protection of God against the resistance that came from all the opposition and the waves of resistance. And his protection came in and they became unified and they they were looking out for each other and they were watching each other's back. We make this book up at a wall, but it's not about a wall at all. This book is about a returning. It is a bit of returning. The wall represents something so great. It represents a unity that we see reflected in the Trinity through Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This perfect example of a unity. It represents all of that. Like it represents a coming together. But it also represents a wall that they had let come down around their own hearts. And we go back to Proverbs 25, 28. It says a man without self-control is like a city with their walls. So today I want to invite you to fortify your walls, but not, not to put your guard up. Fortify your walls to be self-controlled so that you can stay in community with the king. So that you can stay in community with your family, this church family. So that you will not give up on what God is doing in your life. This ball, this book, yes, it's about rebuilding a wall, but it's about returning to the King of Kings, returning to the Lord of Lords, and reestablishing that meaningful connection with their source of hope, peace, love, joy, gentleness, and to have the self-control to maintain it. He calls us to scorn shame because it has no hold on us any longer because he because he did it on the cross because he despised shame on the cross we today through the power of the Holy Spirit can look at shame and we can despise it and we can say this is not my identity this is not who I am amen we are going to gather around this table and we're going to celebrate everything we've talked about this morning And we're going to believe for what this little cup, it's just a little goopy looking little thing, but this is such a massive, such a massive, massive, massive symbolism to what goes on here. We have this little piece of bread, this little wafer, seems so simple, it's not even as big as a quarter. But it represents the broken body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It represents what he went through and the process he went through to bring victory to us, to renew our relationship with him. Just as he was calling people back to relationship with him in Nehemiah, the whole reason he went to this cross is to fix the relationship that we broke. 
and he allowed his body to be broken to do it. That's what this little wafer represents this morning. And so we're going to thank him for that. Father, thank you for what this little wafer represents in our life. Thank you that you stood in our place as a sinless, spotless Lamb of God and did something none of us could do. You took upon the sins of the world. You allowed your body to be broken for us, Lord Jesus. We remember this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Bless this little wafer. In Jesus' name, let's partake together. It says, in the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant. In my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. If his blood wasn't shed, we would not be here today. If his blood wasn't shed, our prayer for healing this morning would be just worthless words. But they're not, because this healing were provided through the stripes he bore on his back. The healing was provided for us today. And I just thank you, again, thinking about this, this candle and hope and what it represents. This cup, although we remember such a brutal killing of the Son of God, he made it beautiful. He scorned the shame. This is why we don't put up pictures of Jesus on the cross anymore because he's not there anymore because he scorned the shame for all of us. He despised the shame for all of us so that we could be free and his blood flowed for you and me so that ours would not have to and the dichotomy of understanding that this red scarlet blood is what washes us white as snow is so beautiful because he scorned the shame. So today we remember what this represents in our life and what he did for us and the freedom we get to live in because of it and the hope we have to spend eternity with him forever. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what this cup represents. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you shed your blood for us. Over the generations, Lord, countless animals were sacrificed and none of them were sufficient. Some were sacrificed, oh God, and it wasn't the best that people had. It wasn't sufficient. Even the best, the best that people had, their first fruits in the Old Testament, could not compare, could not do what your perfect lamb that you sent to us did for us. And so, Lord, today, oh God, we thank you, Lord, that you died on the cross and in so doing nailed our sins to the cross, despising shame for all of us. We thank you for what this cup represents today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Let's partake together.